Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Is Cucumber Automation Killing Your Project? Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so that you know how to participate in today's event. You should see your GoToWebinar control panel in the upper right-hand corner of your computer screen. You have joined the presentation using your computer speaker system by default. If you would prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you have selected mic and speakers and are having difficulty hearing me, please toggle the telephone option in your control panel and dial in. If you are experiencing any issues, please type in the details in the question section of your control panel. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send your questions in at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you will receive a follow-up email within 48 hours with a link to view the recording. I would now like to pass the mic over to Bill McGee, Senior Director of Corporate Marketing at Sauce Labs, who will be introducing the webinar. Bill? Thanks, Lucy, and thank you all for joining today's webinar. Fasten your seatbelts. I think we're going to be in for a great discussion about BDD automation. Uh, you may have seen Nikolai's recent post, a blog post, is BDD automation actually killing your project. It uh, generated uh, quite a bit of buzz on Twitter and social media and was the impetus for today's session. Uh, Nikolai has posited that using BDD tools may be hurting your project and making your test automation uh, more difficult. So today he'll spend some time sharing his thoughts on this with you and as Lucy mentioned, we'll then open it up for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Nikolai. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Bill. Um, can you all hear me okay? Take the silence as a yes. Um, yeah, well, thank you all so much for joining the webinar. I sincerely appreciate everybody taking some time out of your day to be watching me um, speaking stuff from my mind. So, is Cucumber Automation Killing Your Project? Is what we're going to be talking about today. Um, as Bill already said, my name is Nikolai Volokhin. I'm a Senior Solutions Architect here at Sauce Labs. Um, it's just a fancy title. All that ultimately means is that I have a bunch of test automation experience. I've worked at really small companies where we're super agile. We make all kind of testing decisions, all technology decisions, and we can move really fast. And I've worked at very large organizations like international organizations where things are not as easy, things move slower, lots of hurdles and rules to overcome. So I have a pretty good experience there. And now I am lucky enough to basically travel around the US and the world and help clients succeed in test automation. Uh, that doesn't only mean UI automation. I basically help clients to implement continuous integration, continuous delivery as close as they want to get to it. Um, and help them strategize whether they want to do more unit testing or API testing or build a continuous integration pipeline and get faster feedback. That's kind of my focus. I'm a non-biased individual helping people overall succeed with test automation. But most importantly on this slide is the fact that I am an animal lover. That's the most important credential, which means that if you disagree with anything that I say, just remember that part because you can't. So automation is hard. I wish I could ask for people to raise their hands here, but I'm sure that if I did ask for people to raise their hands here, pretty much everybody would agree with that statement. Because there's just simply so much to learn. We've got Selenium, for example, right? And doing all the communication with the browser. We've got Appium, we've got iOS, we've got Android. We've got the automation pyramid, so many pyramids these days, right? We've got unit testing, API testing, UI testing, how much of each should I do? How much unit testing? When do I do API tests? How do I put them all together? It's so much information to learn. We've got tools like Cucumber. We've got tools like Sauce Labs. We've got tools like Mocha. By the way, when making this presentation, I realized that we really love food in the automation industry. And uh, bagel, anybody? Um, but all of this information and tools can certainly make our head explode, right? It makes automation really hard simply just because we have 
so many concepts to grasp. And so a key to successful test automation is kissing. Wait, sorry, not this kissing, this kissing. Keeping it simple, stupid. And the reason for that is because every decision that we make in test automation and software development is a chance for us to move down a path that will make our success more likely or less likely. For example, we can decide to do a UI test for a feature rather than a unit test. As a result, that decision automatically makes our testing thousands of times slower and drastically more inefficient because of maintenance costs will be much higher. For example, if we also decide to cre recreate our own page object model versus reuse one that has existed for about 15 years. Also, for example, picking a tool that has excellent reporting for the reporting mechanisms versus picking the right tool for the job. All of these kind of different decisions, they continue to compound and either make our automation more likely to succeed or less likely to succeed. And so it's important to always keep in mind that simplicity is key. We want to minimize the amount of decisions that we have to make, and we want to focus on keeping things as simple as possible so that the success of our test automation project is as high as possible. So with that said, and considering it's kind of uh, election season, I wanted to do a quick poll here and see uh, which president you all want to vote for. No, just kidding. It'll be uh, related to the test automation topics. So here comes the first question. I believe that you should be uh, seeing a question on your screen. Uh, who writes the business specs along with the developer and VA before starting development? So basically is, Yes, you, the three amigos, are writing the business specs, or someone else, maybe it's one person writing the business specs. Um, in that, in which case, that'll be the second answer. But if you are working together with the two other amigos to write business specs, you'll select the first answer. So I'm very curious. I have some idea here in terms of how this will be scored, but uh, I never actually had any hard data on this. So I'd be very curious to get all the participants and the information from this. Okay, awesome. There's gonna be one more question, only two questions, and then I will do all the presenting. Second question, who uses Cucumber? So. Either you use Cucumber or you don't. It's pretty, pretty binary decision. I'm just curious as well. Cool. So I believe that in a second we should all be able to see the results, which I am very curious to see. Okay, cool. So 32% um, of people do follow the BDD process, basically, and 68% of people do not. I am honestly very surprised by that number because I would have thought that people that don't actually follow the BDD process and write specs with amigos is much higher. But okay, cool. Good to know. And let's see the second one. Oh, wow. Okay. So 55% um, of the people, 54% of the people use Cucumber and 46% do not. So that's interesting. So, okay, cool. Very good to know. Thank you all so much for taking that poll. I was curious about those statistics. So let's talk a little bit about Cucumber, right? Because I'm sure that is why you all are here. So Cucumber is one of those 
automated testing tools that I believe does not help to contribute to successful test automation when used without BDD together. A lot of us, as you all just saw, um, a good percentage of us do test automation with Cucumber without actually following the BDD process. And as Aslak Helsoy, the creator of Cucumber, tells us that Cucumber is not a testing tool. Cucumber was actually created to facilitate the process of BDD. The process of BDD is behavior-driven development where we actually sit down with the three amigos, we write the business specification before any software is written, and then we use the business specification to drive the development of the software that we are trying to create. And so um, what I'm trying to propose here is that if we're not following that, and if we're not following behavior-driven development, what that ultimately means is that you should not be using Cucumber. Oh, wait, sorry, wrong Cucumber. So many foods, food analogies here. This Cucumber, okay? That's what the founders and the creators of Cucumber tell us. Um, don't use Cucumber if you're not following the BDD process. But of course, as my statistics here show a little bit incorrectly, for all the other people, for us that who choose to ignore the creators of Cucumber and other test automation experts and continue to use the tool without actually following the process. What is it that we can do and why is it that Cucumber is going to actually hinder the progress and the success of our test automation? Well, let's go take a look. Um, so I'm actually going to do something a, a little crazy, I guess. I'm going to break all the rules in demoing and I'm gonna code live for you all and um, cross my fingers and pray that everything will work out. So my goal here is that I'm going to code uh, some solutions that don't use Cucumber, and then I'm gonna implement the same exact solution that does use Cucumber, and uh, hopefully you all can see it side by side, and we can just talk about the differences. So let's take a look here. Um, so I spared you all the pain of me creating a new Java project. And by the way, all the concepts here apply to pretty much all the programming languages. Um, I'm using Java just because it's the most popular, um, you know, Selenium automation programming language in the world. So pe most people are familiar with it, but this, these concepts kind of apply all over the place. So anyway, what I have here is a an initial class that I've started. Um, a, I'm calling it a login feature test, and we're going to be testing this application. Let me show you here. We're going to be testing this application here, saucedemo.com. And the very first test that comes to my mind, the simplest test to start with, is to pull up this page and make sure that it actually loads. So let's go ahead and code out that test. So I'm gonna go ahead and wire up a test method here. And actually, let's not do that. And let's call this test should open. And we're going to require a driver, right, in order to work with a browser. So I did cheat a little bit here because we have a limited amount of time and I don't want you all to be falling asleep. I did do have a method ready that's basically going to instantiate a brand new remote web driver, okay? So I'm gonna copy it in here. Let's go ahead and import all of the missing statements. Um, import that let's see what else uh, we're going to import this and we're going to import the remote web driver fantastic cool so i'm just simply going to use this method to grab my driver from there and of course it wants me to throw an exception okay cool now that we've got our driver the very first thing we're going to want to do is actually open up our page right so let's create a new class call it login page and instantiate it and pass in our driver, if I can spell. Cool, so we've got our login page. Next, what we actually wanna do is open it, right? So let's go ahead and open it. None of these methods exist yet, don't worry, we're going to implement all of them. And then we just want an assertion to assert that our login page is loaded, right? I think that's a good term to use, is loaded. Sound good? Fantastic. 
All right, so here's our test. Let's fix these problems. So it's complaining that a driver doesn't exist. Let's go ahead and create our field called the driver. Fantastic. Uh, of course, it's complaining that a login page class doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and create it. Um, let's stick it into here. Fantastic. That takes care of that problem. Of course, now it's going to complain saying we don't have a constructor. So let's go ahead and create a constructor and we'll set a driver here to the driver that we passed in. Um, and let's go ahead and create a field for that. Fantastic. That problem taken care of. Um, let's create an open method that doesn't exist as well. So we're just going to use our driver here to get um, the URL and that URL I'm going to grab from here. Pass that in and done. And what else we got left? We got an assertion. That's just a JUnit static method. So let's go ahead and import that. And then we just need to use the is loaded method, uh, create the is loaded method. So let's go ahead and do that. So is loaded basically is just going to validate that our page is right successfully loaded, successfully visible. So let's go ahead and use an explicit weight. I hope you all know to only use explicit weights in your test automation. So I'm going to create a new, oh, not a capital, a new web driver weight um, that takes in a driver and the time out in seconds of 10. I think that's a reasonable time to wait until an element is visible or not visible. So then let's do a wait until we'll use the expected conditions class that Selenium so kindly provides us. And we're going to look for uh, visibility of element located. Let's do this top one. Visibility. Yeah, perfect. And then we'll use our by. And then let's see what we've got here. Um, I'm just going to go with this username field to me. If that's present, that's kind of good enough to know that we're on the correct page. I see it's got an ID, so I'm just going to grab that. So let's do by ID. And of course, we need strings around that ID, right? Um, there you go. And uh, we need to check if it's displayed. That's actually a redundant call, an extra wire call that I wouldn't normally make. I would wrap this in a try catch block and return a Boolean. But in the interest of time, I am making an extra wire call. Um, OK. Cool, fantastic. So that is our test. Of course, it's missing an annotation. There you go, fantastic. And let's import that annotation and we should be good to go. So let's give this a run and see if this test is working. So it's running, let's go ahead and get into my Sauce Labs account and see if it's actually running. There's a little session running. Um, nice, there it is. Started less than a minute ago. So that's the one. So this test passed. Well, it didn't pass, it ran. Um, the test is actually going to time out in Sauce Labs because I'm not quitting the driver. I'm not ending the session. So let's just go ahead and end the session here. I'm gonna do that um, by adding a cleanup method. And so we need always need to check if the driver is null because the instantiation of the driver can be null. So you want to double check that. And if it is, if it's not, we're going to quit it. Fantastic. Um, otherwise, we'll get weird errors. Um, cool. That all looks great to me. And so this test is done. So I don't know what that took a couple minutes, five minutes to create this automated functional test. Uh, we can rerun it again to just for everyone to make sure that I'm not cheating and it's actually working. So that should start up a brand new test here in a second. See, this session is gonna time out. This one should complete. It's not gonna get an actual pass or fail status because I'm not setting that right now. It's irrelevant, but um, this one will run. We can even come in here and take a look what it's doing. See, there it is. It opened up the page and then it will actually complete. So give it a second. I did everything right. Oh, of course, it's not going to complete. You know why? Because I never added an attribute here. Durr. That's what happens with live coding. You forget stuff. Anyway, try take my word on it. That's irrelevant. So take a look at this test here. What I ask you to look at and think about is, is this test readable? Can you understand what this test is doing? I mean, we can move this into a setup method and make it a little bit more clean or fine. But how about this part? 
is this part readable? Can you easily understand what you can and can't do with it? And is it helpful to know that you have an IDE to guide you in your test automation process, right? Let's pretend we had these page objects kind of coded out and we have the methods for it. Would it be helpful to know that you can use something like a login page to maybe open it or to validate that it's loaded or to log in or to log out or any other operation, having the IDE provide that to us? I, I think it's pretty helpful. And I also think that it's pretty, this test is pretty readable, easy for anyone to understand, um, anyone that needs to understand what this code is doing. Okay, cool. So next step, we are going to uh, data drive this and make it run in parallel, which is the most exciting part, right? Making things just run in parallel. I feel like it's so much fun. So um, the very first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm gonna grab a uh, collection of browsers and operating systems. Again, for the sake of not putting you to sleep, I've compiled that list beforehand because do you really want to see me type out a bunch of strings um, of browsers and operating systems so i'm here i'm just importing all of the um all of the statements and that looks good so next what do we need to do here in order to let me zoom out a little bit now what do we need to do here in order to actually make this pit um, run through parallel uh, and be able to be data driven through this object. Of course, we can pass it in from an external config, but again, for the sake of simplicity, I'm just configuring it here. Uh, well, we just need to update uh, these three parameters, right? So we'll need a platform name, a browser version, and a browser name. So let's just go ahead and create those. Um, so let's create a getter. Um, actually, we don't even need a getter. We just need a property. We're gonna just gonna create a string and we're gonna call it browser name. And we're gonna make that parameterized. There we go. And let me just double check here the collection. So the order, the order of these is important for IntelliJ to know which parameter is which. So we got yup browser name, operating system, platform, and uh, and version. So next one we're gonna create, we're gonna do platform. And of course that will also be a parameter. There you go. And this one should be one. Excellent, and then we'll create the last parameter. And that one's gonna be browser version. Awesome, and that will also be a parameter. And this one will be two. All right, fantastic, that looks good. So now we have our parameters that will be, got, that will be retrieved from that collection. And now we just need to pass in those here. Platform. Um, this will be browser version. And then this will be browser name. There you go, fantastic. Let's see, what else am I missing here? Um, oh, yeah, of course, we want to do um, a run with here so that it runs with parameters. Um, okay, that's gonna be good. Let's give this a shot. I think this is pretty good. Let's see what happens. Worst case, I get an error and we have to figure it out. Cool, so it's doing something, it's running. Let's go ahead and it's here. Oh, nice, I got 10 sessions started. Fantastic. So let's take a look. Uh, here you see a bunch of sessions and they are running on um, different operating systems and browsers. Fantastic. So that was a nice, and we got 10, 10 successes. Fantastic. This didn't go nearly as good as in my uh, in my preparation, which is awesome that it's going flawlessly here. Um, so we've got our 10 tests. They're data-driven. 
parameterized and running in parallel. And of course, if you want to know how to run in parallel with uh, with Java, you just need the Maven Surefire plugin, which I had ahead of time, just again, so that you're not having, watching me search for a Maven Surefire plugin online and then copying and pasting that unnecessary. Uh, so there you go. So this is, we've written a single test. This test has been data-driven, has been ran in parallel. Let's go ahead and do the same exact thing in Cucumber. So let me do here. And I'm going to kill all of this work. I'm so sorry. Because I, I, the branches are in a clean state to begin with. And I want um, I'm going to check. I'm going to share this code with you all afterwards anyway. So don't worry. Um, you will be able to have it if you want it. So here I have, let me double check. I should have a clean solution of Cucumber implementation. Now, Cucumber does have a nice Maven archetype that you can run that actually generated me this. So that was super friendly. Otherwise, if you don't, I don't know if other, other implementations have it, but if they don't, you have to create these classes here. You have to have a run Cucumber test. You have to have a step definitions file and you have to have a feature file. This is where all of our tests are going to go. So let's go ahead and start recreating that same exact test using Cucumber. So the very first thing we have to do is create a scenario, actually a feature, sorry. So feature. So our feature is, I'm going to say that should work. Oh, I'm going to call it login page. And then I'm going to say here, login page should work. All right, then we're gonna create a scenario. A scenario is the same thing as a test that we just created. So our scenario is, should open. So now we're going to use our Gherkin syntax to be able to create recreate that same exact scenario using Cucumber. Gherkin syntax is very important to learn. One thing that I keep seeing over and over in terms of Cucumber implementation is we all fail to learn correct Gherkin syntax. There's like at least 100 rules we need to follow. So we need to make sure we follow them. Uh, so given a user opens a browser, uh, when a user goes to the login page, then is our assertion, the user sees, uh, man, can't spell sees, the login page loaded. How does that sound? Okay, cool. Looks good to me. Let's go ahead and run this. Uh, one of the other nice features of Cucumber here is it will spit me out the fact that I haven't implemented these step definitions. So let's go ahead and implement these step definitions. Sorry, got to copy this. It's not so easy to copy that. If we have more, it'll be more troublesome. All right, got them. And we've got to paste them in our step definitions here. So let's go ahead. Oh, so I got totally the wrong thing. My bad. Let's grab it here. There you go. Second time is the charm. Perfect. Awesome. Let's import and import this and import the when and import the given. Fantastic. We've got our given when and then. So now we actually need to implement the logic in here. So let's go ahead. A user opens the browser. I have shown you all that method previously. So let's go ahead and copy it in here because I copied it for the other solution. It's only fair that I copy it here. And let's go ahead and re-import everything again. Importing, importing, importing is my life. Um, hold on, there you go. Let's import the web driver, uh, throw the malformed URL exception, and now we should be solid and create a driver. Okay, fantastic. So now a user opens the, the browser, right? We can set a driver here and then create driver. Perfect. Of course, it's going to complain that it wants to throw an exception, so let's throw an exception. And it complains that this field doesn't exist, so let's go ahead and create it. Fantastic. 
done with this method right here. Now, a user goes to the login page. Okay, so we need a login page here and we need to go to it. So let's do login page, login page, new yes. Unfortunately, you have to watch me redo all of this because whether you're using Cucumber or any type of implementation, the page object pattern should be implemented in all of our UI test automation. So yes, you have to watch me rewrite the same exact code that I just wrote five or 10 minutes ago. Um, and so now that we have our login page, we're gonna use our login page to open it. All right, cool. Now using our, we'll create the class, which doesn't exist. Great, and then let's go back. Of course, it complains about the constructor again, so let's create it a constructor. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna pass in the driver. And so then we want to implement this driver. There you go, now we've got that. And let's implement the open method. That's a simple one, get, that'll be awesome. And let's go ahead and grab that URL. Fantastic. Let's proceed. We've got this taken care of, right? This step does exactly what we wanted to say. Okay, cool. So now the user sees the login page loaded. Okay, so let's do that. Let's do an assertion here then. Assert true uh, login page. Oh, so another problem here, annoying. So obviously we don't have access to this local variable here. So of course we have to move it at the class level, uh, which to me is a little bit annoying because now, oh, sorry, uh, let's move it at the um, class level. So now, okay, so now we're storing here web driver stuff, we're storing page object stuff. We even got our um, JUnit assertions in here as well. This class is becoming very large very quickly. Um, and I don't like that. Of course, it can be cleaned up, right? We can take some time and clean this up. My question is like, is it necessary? Like, why is this really happening? As I'm implementing this code, why is this class growing so big, so large? And how are we gonna manage it in the future? It's kind of what I'm thinking about in my head right now, but um, let's proceed. Let's finish is loaded, great. All right, of course it needs to import JUnit. So let's put JUnit in here as well. And let's create this method is loaded. So again, unfortunately, you're gonna to have to watch me use the web driver weights. Um, if you don't know why you should only use explicit weights in your test automation, definitely talk to me afterwards. Um, it is a good strategy, especially when running in the cloud and you have to deal with all the uh, network requests. Um, using expected conditions is a really solid way to make sure your automation is more stable. Um, so let's wait until some expected conditions. And we're gonna do visibility of element located by ID. And I, what was it like user dash name, right? I think, it's, I think so. And of course we have to do is displayed and we have to import this guy and yup. And we have to return here. Um, and of course we lost our driver. There you go, cool. Uh, no, we lost our weight. There you go. Cool, let me just make sure on this. Yep, it is user dash name. Okay, cool, fantastic. So that is done. And so now I believe we are successfully completed with our implementation. Let's give this a run and see what happens. There's no such thing as MVM, maybe uh, VMN, sorry. Let's give that a run, it's running. Let's see if it starts up a session here. Uh, we still got a bunch of sessions. Oh, it's running 10 sessions, of course, because we need to rebuild our project. Sorry about that. Remaining executables there. Cool. Let's give that another shot. Nice, all right, so we got one session that's starting up. Now, there you go, perfect. So this one is running, All if all works successfully, it'll actually gonna, so this passed. So here's that nice reporting that we all love from Cucumber that appears here. Our session has passed, 
we need to clean it up. So let's go ahead and add an after here, after hook. So um, let's do a teardown. Um, and I don't need it to throw an exception. And we're gonna do, again, if driver is not equal to null, then we are going to quit it. Fantastic. And let me make sure that this is the right import here. Yep, uh, no, I don't want the J unit after actually. We want a cucumber after here. There you go, excellent. Let's give this a shot and now everything should work and even clean up the browser. See how this one is running? It's, it's again, because I wasn't ending the session and stopping the browser. So um, the, hard, the hard life of coding live is you end up making mistakes, which is no big deal. So this one is running. We should see it open up a page. Oh, it ran so fast. And you can see here, it finished, uh, even though it didn't get it any test status. So that's pretty much it. So that's this implementation here. You saw what we had to do. So now we're gonna do the same thing, data-driven cross-browser parallel using this. Um, oh, and one other thing that I was kind of talking about was um, we see that this is getting kind of clunky and big. This is only a single test that I've written so far, right? A single feature that I've implemented. And this file is already getting kind of big and tons of dependencies. So probably needs to be cleaned up. You need some refactoring efforts, of course. Again, my question is, why is that really necessary? Is it potentially, is it, is it possible to bypass this? I don't know, but let's proceed. So, unfortunately, I actually failed in my ability to implement cross-browser parallel test execution using Cucumber. I had this like whole grand vision where I was going to compare a, an implementation without using Cucumber and an implementation with using Cucumber and show off just like the technical limitations of the tool. But of course, like life kicked in, I got more demands for my work. I got more responsibilities. Lack of time as well is just the amount of time that I had to prepare was not sufficient for me to achieve my goals. And so after spending several hours trying to debug the problems, trying to read the documentation, trying to Google for answers, I wasn't able to come up with a solution. Um, I did come up with a solution that looked like this, which I thought was the right route using data tables. Oh, and by the way, if you can't tell, I'm not a Cucumber or BDD expert at all. I hope that nobody ever thinks that. I just know enough with it to be reckless. And so, I tried to come up with something like this, but I wasn't able to make this work. And I ended up with a minimum viable product because of a lack of time that was like this, where basically every given statement was taking in a browser and a version and an operating system, which was horrible because my code ended up looking like this, where even though I refactored as much stuff as I can, Look at this like crazy duplication here and this mess and the fact that I would need a step definition for every browser operating system combination. This was how I felt afterwards. And I just said, look, I, I can't do this. It's not gonna happen right now. Is there a better way to implement cross-browser parallel test execution using Cucumber? There probably is. I'm sure there are dozens of people on the phone right now who have overcome this challenge and who know exactly how to do it. They can take my hand, they can lead me through the efforts and they can tell me exactly what to do. But you know what was really interesting is I realized that it was a kind of a cool lesson in my journey here was, aren't these the same exact challenges that we face in test automation in general? We all have more responsibilities, a lack of time, right? Our boss is throwing more demands on us and asking us for different things from different directions. And so that's exactly kind of what got me thinking is like, this is almost like a real life kind of thing. And so even though 
I wasn't able to achieve it, my question was ultimately, will you, will someone else be able to achieve it? Maybe, maybe it's my incompetence and my inability to follow the documentation or my the fact that I'm not an expert in cucumber and so I couldn't do it. But what if it's not? What if it's just those extra barriers that I was talking about in terms of achieving something and just making it a little harder, a little bit more out of reach? I don't know, but again, it's just a question that I pose here for you all. So back to my PowerPoint rant. As you all saw, we don't always use Cucumber, but obviously when we do, it's certainly without BDD, which is not 100% true, as we all saw from the polls. But the question is, why is Cucumber automation without the BDD process such a problem for us? Well, so it begins with the scenario, right? The scenario that reason English like language. That scenario is linked to a step definition, and that step definition contains a page object. And along the way, we have to learn things such as correct Gherkin syntax. If we're the only person doing test automation on the team and we're using Cucumber for test automation, and then we still have to write the correct Gherkin syntax. The stuff that you saw was basically what we have to learn and implement in order for the solution to work. A lot of us, even though it's a horrible idea, I get this question from customers all the time, they want their manual testers involved in test automation as well using Cucumber. And so if that's the case, we not only have to teach correct Gherkin syntax to our automation engineers, we also have to teach it to our manual testers as well. We also have to teach those individuals how to use regex. Again, if it's just automation engineers doing it, we have to learn how can we correctly pass in an integer? What happens if I want to pass in a string? What happens if I want to parameterize stuff? And in this GIF, you can kind of see here these documentations that I've captured from Cucumber that show you exactly how to do it and what to do. But if we're having teams working with Cucumber, we have to learn this stuff. This is part of the tool and how to use it correctly. We have to learn how to manage step definitions. You only saw a little glimpse. I wish I had way more time to code more solutions on this webinar, but you only saw a little glimpse into the step definitions. But imagine the kind of problems that can arise. For example, a user creates an account versus a user makes an account versus a user opens an account. Are those all different step definitions? or are they exactly the same? And how are you going to prevent a manual tester or another person implementing step definitions from creating a brand new one for one that already exists? And even a better scaling strategy is something that we're going to have to figure out whenever we're using Cucumber. Now, with JUnit, for example, Cucumber paralyzes at the feature level. And so what that ultimately means is that if you're lucky enough like me to have 100 sessions that you can run concurrently, I would need 100 feature files to be able to run in, in parallel and maximize my test automation feedback. Even if you don't have 100, even if you have 20 sessions that you can run in parallel, that means you have to have 20 feature files. Now, this also applies for .NET as well, and certainly for JavaScript. So just another challenge that we all have to think about when adding Cucumber to our tech stack is how do we overcome potentially one of the most important capabilities of test automation, which is parallelization. And of course, we still have to learn how to create good page objects because as I've mentioned previously, whether you're using Cucumber or you're not using Cucumber for UI test automation, at least we have to utilize page objects. And of course, everyone on the team who's doing automation needs to learn our test automation framework because we you build a test automation framework, build a bunch of tools on top of it, and then people have to use it. And just FYI, this is the exact architecture of my automation framework. But I had a dream and I still have a dream and I wonder, what if we actually didn't add 
Cucumber to our test automation? And what if we remove the step definitions and the scenarios and we just replace them with the test that is going to be written anyway, but rather than adding an extra layer of abstraction through Cucumber syntax, we just write the test initially. Is this test that much less readable than the Cucumber test? I, I don't think so. From the people I've polled, they don't think so as well. And you also gain the advantage of discoverability through the IDE that can show you exactly which methods and which properties are available on your page objects whenever you're trying to write a test. And what if you didn't need to overcome all of these challenges that I just talked about and you were just left with the bare essentials that you still have to do for UI test automation? But you don't have to do it for all test automation, but at least for UI test automation. And you were just left with those and you removed all those extra hurdles and all those extra burdens from your teams and from your implementations. That's my question to you is would it make it easier for you to code test automation without all of that? So I leave you basically with this. It's the same point that Ask Like Helsoy, the creator of Cucumber, has made is the same exact point that I am here trying to make is that if you're using Cucumber without following BDD practices, which in my experience, almost everybody does, according to the poll that I saw was a little bit different, but according to my experience and our automation engineering experience at Sauce Labs, um, almost nobody follows the BDD process. And so most of us just use Cucumber and they, we don't want to use it. And I try to explain to you here with technical reasons and all the potential hurdles that you have to overcome simply by adding Cucumber to your pipeline. Now, if you're doing BDD, that's potentially a different story. But this is for the majority of us that are using Cucumber without following the behavior driven development process. And so that's for you to think about. You get to decide is Cucumber going to make your automation process easier or harder? And while you think about it, of course, be sure to eat a bagel. Just please make sure that it's vegan because that's good for the environment. And so now I leave it out to questions and for us to look at this very cute dog. Hey, Nikolai, thanks. That is great. Uh, we do have a number of questions rolling in. I will try to uh, parse them as um, succinctly as possible. Um, one is coming in saying, there are Gherkin frameworks that don't require step definitions and are maintainable. What do you think of that approach? Mm -hmm. um, I, I would like to see them. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there, someone can follow up with the link or just reach out to me on Twitter or LinkedIn. You can DM me, you can hit me up on public and we can have this conversation. I am super excited to talk about this topic and I think it's a topic that needs to be discussed because my challenge that I'm always experiencing and same with everybody on our team is we're always rescuing people from Cucumber implementations when they complain that they're not going well. So if there are solutions to these problems, I would love to see them. Let's please discuss it. Um, I mean, I'm here talking about Cucumber and how it adds those dependencies. If there are other tools that resolve those dependencies, that may be the solution. I don't know. I really, I, I do enjoy the English-like syntax of Gherkin and I understand the potential benefits so if there are better implemented solutions out there, then maybe that's the answer. Okay, well, we'll definitely, we are getting some dialogue here, so we will be able to uh, open this up and get some of that feedback. Uh, actually, Stud wrote back and said the framework is called Karate, and it also supports parallel execution, mm -hmm. but um, we will uh, we'll put that out into uh, conversation. Um, uh, we've got a question here that is, why not use a scenario outline and pass parameters to single step? Uh, again, so as I will gladly admit, I am not a Cucumber expert and I'm not a BDD expert. I know enough to be reckless. I know enough from what I've read from the documentation. Um, and if, yeah, again, as I said, I'm sure there are people that know exactly the implementation to do for the cross-browser data-driven test. I wasn't able to figure it out, 
from my maybe three hours of searching and trying it. Again, that says little about the tool uh, because maybe it's just my incompetence, but maybe it says something about the tool. I don't know. So um, yeah, that's my answer. Yeah, okay, well, that's fair enough. Um, Simon writes, is there a good way to move back from Cucumber to JUnit? Hmm. Yeah, so this, that's, a, that's an interesting question because this is actually the kind of situation that we continuously encounter with all of our customers. Um, I, I feel like I have a pretty good base in terms of sample size for my customers being all over the world and different size teams. And the challenge is, again, I think the main challenge is that people think they're doing BDD when really they are just adding Cucumber to their automation pipeline and then they're claiming they're doing BDD, which is, it's, it's not a blame on anyone. I don't know how this manifested. This manifests all the time, right? At some point, people were trying to use Selenium for API automation. Um, people are trying to use Selenium for like database testing. I don't know how this manifests, but I believe that that avoiding th this is the kind of problem that we have like many clients in and so i i i don't really know the so the good solution to that problem it's almost like if maybe if the code was the solution was used efficiently from the get-go it wouldn't be a problem but if the solution is solely to encourage collaboration are there other means to be doing collaboration besides following the BDD process? Maybe I don't know. I've seen I, I've seen other teams collaborating successfully without um, following BDD, but other people that have done BDD say that it's fantastic. So um, I don't know what a, that good transition looks like. I would honestly say do your best to follow the Cucumber documentation as close as possible and make your automation based on their recommendations. I am sure that they have your best interest at heart. My question at, at the end of it would be, was all that work necessary? Did, would, did, you, did you actually bridge collaboration gaps and fix any problems, or did you simply just add all that extra overhead to your automation that I just showed? Gotcha, gotcha. Um, I've got one that... Uh... I think uh, you, you could consider a softball. What IDE are you using? Oh, that was IntelliJ. My favorite. Okay. My favorite for Java. All right. I, I like it because you don't have to say it. It's just fantastic. It saves automatically. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, uh, we've got one here. What is your opinion about using Cucumber for API frameworks? Oh, cool. That's a That's a cool question. Yeah, so that's... One thing, I, I wanted to write another blog post about all, all the, I don't know if you all have seen, there's been so many wars on Twitter and LinkedIn about all the stuff that I've been talking about. I know all the Cucumber people hate me now, um, but I wanted to follow, write a, a follow-up post where I do believe a potential life for Gherkin-like syntax or just a, like a, maybe even a DSL or Cucumber could be in the realm of API testing or unit testing because those tend to be less easily readable, especially like API tests. Because how do you, how do you, there's no very well defined pattern. Like in UI test automation, we have the page object pattern. That's something implemented well that can make your test readable. And so then the problem of readability doesn't really exist anymore. In API testing, it's kind of harder because there is no defined pattern really for interacting with your API. And so potentially there, the Gherkin-like syntax could be very helpful in terms of determining what your test is and isn't doing. I guess my question to that would be, what is the goal that you're trying to achieve? Is, are you trying to make your test more readable and so you're adding all this extra overhead to your automation for the readability? But then who's gonna be reading it? Is it gonna be you or is it gonna be your team? And so then if it's your team, then you should be following the BDD process, right? And collaborating, in which case you have to use Cucumber. But then if you're not following the BDD process and you're using Cucumber just to make it more readable, I don't know if all that extra overhead and complexity 
is necessary. I mean, even as like Hellsoy says himself, Cucumber, you don't want to use it if that's all you're doing is just automating a browser. And I, I would guess the same thing applies to APIs as well. And I'm sorry that my questions are not so de definitive an answer. It's still a lot of stuff and in, a lot of information that I'm kind of taking into my head and processing. So I'm kind of just sharing my thoughts just to let you know where I'm at. Well, and I'm, I'm sure the cucumber people don't hate you. I definitely know that the animal lovers and the vegans are throwing accolades your way. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, Perfect. So that's 0 0.001 <laughs> of the population. Well, uh, yes, there you go. Um, so let's see if we can go with this. Uh, okay. Uh, why do you need explicit weight for each page object method? Hmm. Why do we need explicit weight for each page object method? Should I should I talk about this even even though it's unrelated to Cucumber? It's a, it's related to more test automation best practices. I I'll, I'll talk about it very quickly. Uh, so an explicit weight um, is basically basically allows you to make sure that your browser is in a correct state before you interact with it, um, and so when doing UI test automation, before we interact with an element, we want to make sure that that element is in a good state. You don't need it in every single method, absolutely not. What you need to do is make sure that your, your page is in a good state for interaction before interacting with it. Now, for example, let's say that page that I was showing you, once it's rendered, it's rendered. You don't need explicit weights for any other call afterwards. You can use driver.findElement without a problem and you're not going to get into any synchronization issues beforehand but if you don't do that and for whatever reason let's say you have some lag or potentially you're using like a proxy or a tunnel or something like that then when you push that code into that environment and you have the lag your test is going to fail because of synchronization problems and so having an explicit wait allows you to wait for a dynamic condition that you can check on for example is element displayed which means that it's in the DOM and actually visible before proceeding with the rest of your actions. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So um, we're getting to the top of the hour. Uh, I know you mentioned that you would be sharing the uh, source code so that you can, uh, so that folks can play around with it. Uh, we will be sending out an email with a link to the recording and to the slides, uh, and we can also include links to uh, your repo and any other. Uh, uh, code examples that you would have us uh, have us send out to the attendees. Cool. I'll I'll actually throw the repo in the slides as well, so then it'll just everything will just be in one place. Okay. Okay. Well, great. Uh, everyone, thank you so much for participating today. Uh, Nikolai, thank you for sharing your thoughts and for uh, entertaining the Q and A. Um, I know that the conversation is not over. Um, it's it's only just begun. So. Uh, We'll look forward to interacting with everyone, uh, and thank you all for your time. Yeah, thank you all so much for tuning in and taking time out of your day to watch me rant about uh, my opinions. I sincerely appreciate it, and feel free to reach out to me, Twitter, LinkedIn, um, and we can have these conversations, continue them for as long as it takes. I'm super happy to figure this out. Have a wonderful Excellent. day. All right. Thank you. See you all later.